Hey everyone, Marcus here, and thanks so much for watching the assembly portion of this video. I had a lot of fun making this project. I got the idea for it. I'm currently working for an Apple startup called Black Love. We're all former Apple employees and Apple engineers, and this particular Mac that was in the video came from the high school that my mother taught at when I was a kid. Back in those days, in the late 80s, early 90s, for public schools, you know, after the Macs were retired, it was just common that they would just sort of dispose of them or just sort of let them go. And my mother, being a yearbook teacher at the school, they let her keep a, a couple of the old broken computers as opposed to just throwing them away. And for me as a kid, that was like being a kid in a candy store. So one summer, I got the idea to sort of haphazardly paint uh, a broken Mac 512K that uh, my mom obtained from her high school. And basically it was broken, but I just thought it would be cool as a kid to paint it white. And that was about the same time that some iMacs were coming out. I just painted it and basically for the next 25 years it sat in mom's closet. And now that I work for this Apple startup and kind of got thinking about what I could do with it. And I just got the idea that I could paint it black this time since I worked for a company called Black Love and try to modernize it, try to actually see what we could do with the, with the machine. And a disclaimer, I want to stress that no Macs were harmed during the making of this project. We want to preserve these machines, not destroy them or lose them to time and history. And if you are interested in a project like this for yourself, we would recommend to refrain from using a properly working Mac Plus or even a Mac Plus that might be repairable. My personal viewpoint is that we should protect these machines and attempt to keep them as original as possible. This project is best suited for a Mac Plus that would be deemed non-repairable. This would mean a Mac Plus with a deteriorated or corroded analog board or motherboard. If your Mac Plus does not boot or function correctly, there is a good chance that it can be fixed to working order with the proper skills and knowledge. We would want to stress to always attempt repairing these machines before performing a conversion like this. Today, Mac Pluses are readily available on the second-hand market, but another 20-30 years from now, they may not be. If you do decide to take a project like this on, make sure to sell any available spare parts from your Mac to eBay or the open market for others to repair the Macs with. Even if your motherboard or analog board is bad, there are still components on the boards which could be used and helpful for someone else. We should never throw away old Mac analog boards or motherboards. This particular Mac 512K of mine that we used for this project had a deteriorated analog board in which the copper traces on the PCB were oxidizing and molding, which made this 512K a perfect contender for a modern conversion. The analog board was deteriorated and no longer usable. So, Mac 512K pluses or 128K pluses are actually a real thing. In the late 1980s, Apple offered a Mac Plus upgrade program to owners of the 128K and 512K Macs. Owners could mail their Mac computer into Apple or take it to a local Apple authorized service center. And the motherboard would be upgraded along with the floppy drive and a replacement of the rear housing case with a plus housing. After upgrade for these Macs, the front bezel would still be a 128K, 512K bezel but they would have a rear plus housing. The 128K, 512K front bezels have a physical Apple logo emblem that is glued onto the case. However, the later Mac Plus front bezels only had a painted Apple logo on the plastic itself. This makes the 128K, 512K bezels more appealing for this project as the emblem logo could be removed and re-added after painting the case. As someone with no shop fabrication experience, I actually don't have any tools except for basic household items like a drill and a pocket knife. And I thought that something like this would never be possible without fabrication equipment. However, I found that there was an individual on Etsy called Retro Apple AT. He sold prefabricated custom built screens for the Mac 128K through SE. They all use the same screen. So that really opened up the door of possibility 
uh, when I saw that uh, someone was selling some prefabricated screens. Um, the screen is, you know, one of the hardest parts in, in doing this project. So someone else had already kind of taken care of the legwork there. And because of that, the project became much more feasible. After playing around with the case and a Mac Mini that I had, I discovered that a 2014 Mac Mini would actually literally fit in the rear housing. And if the Mac Mini was just placed upside down, the ports actually lined up with the original Mac Plus port cutouts on the housing. It wasn't perfect, but there were enough ports there for functionality. We got a couple of USBs, power was reachable, Ethernet. So it became much more feasible once I realized that the Mac Mini could just be placed upside down in a, in a Mac Plus case. You can see here that we've got a picture of my first attempt at getting the chassis in after modifying the rear mounts. I thought it would be worth noting, you may have noticed that the Mac Mini is upside down, but it's also missing its bottom cover. And it's such a tight fit with the metal chassis on top that I actually couldn't get it to fit with the Mac Mini's bottom panel on. Keeping the bottom panel on would have meant removing the rest of the two mounts for there to be enough space for the metal chassis to fit, which would negate the reason of having the metal chassis there in the first place if the mounts were gone. So the only way I have figured out how to make it fit is with the bottom door off, and thankfully that bottom door is removable anyway. We also experimented with taking the antenna plate off entirely, which would give us a good half inch or an inch more space. However, that would mean that the Mac Mini would have no Wi-Fi unless we did sort of an antenna extension bit of a project. We didn't really want to deal with that, and we were able to make it fit with the antenna plate in, so all good there. At the time, I started with a 2014 Mac Mini, but we ended up having problems with that Mac Mini. The 2014 Mac Mini I had, I bought on eBay years ago, and while it functioned, during this project I decided to reinstall the Mac OS on it, and found out that it actually had a firmware password on it. So the buyer sent, sent the Mac Mini 2014 to me, and we used it, my mom used it for a couple years before we retired it, uh, when it came time to erase it, that's when the firmware password popped up. And ever since then, we, the firmware password has been popping up and we, the machine is actually bricked. So it can't be used after we attempt to erase it because of the previous owner's firmware password on it. So yeah, just basically use it as an excuse to go ahead and move up to a 2018 Mac Mini. At the time I purchased the used 2018 Mac Mini, it was only $300 on Facebook Marketplace. And the 2018 Mac Mini has USB-C which is to be much more viable for this project. USB-C can provide a lot of power, so I was excited for the prospect of being able to use a USB-C hub and sort of drive everything off the USB-C hub. Um, so here is a picture of the first time the screen installed and the bezel attached, and it was just cool to see the, the front bezel sort of come together. But then after a little bit more time and, and ordering some products, got the USB-C hub put together and on the left there is the ribbon HDMI ribbon cable and we've got the microphone and then the uh, custom power cord for the screen inside and the screen I guess was originally intended to just be powered by a standard DC power brick but they actually make USB to DC cables so it can be powered by USB instead of a DC power plug like uh, on the wall so yeah, we got the hub together. And this is a picture of when the screen finally came in from Austria after being stuck in customs for two months. The box came looking horrible and like it had been through heck and back again, but uh, everything was worked and nothing was broken in the case. Here's a picture of the first time on, on uh, the desk when we got sort of the mock-up put together where we had you know, the front bezel with the screen and we had the USB-C dock and the speakers sitting on top of the Mac Mini, which is not in the back case yet. Kind of a proof of concept was coming together. And this is where we got the idea to put the microphone into the original brightness knob area of the front bezel. It actually fit perfect. This was the first time turning on the Mac with with it all loaded up and just no rear housing on it so I was really happy to see that proof of concept that actually worked. We also found that 
um, after the Mac Mini was sort of mounted in the rear housing and held down by the metal chassis, that there was still some lateral movement forwards and backwards. Plugging something into the back of the Mac Mini would push the Mac Mini forward and push it forward in the case and sort of separate it from, from, the, from the back and there would be a gap there. So the solution we came up with for that was to just uh, glue a piece of wood onto the bottom of the housing um, into the exact spot where the Mac Mini could fit. We used epoxy to hold that piece of wood on. And that piece of wood is actually a craft letter I from the store Michaels, the hobby store Michaels. And there's a section where they sell paintable letters. And this letter is just the lowercase letter I, which is essentially just a block of wood. And it ended up being the perfect size to fit right onto the edge of the case. And the bottom side of the eye was sanded down to remove the paint that the epoxy could adhere better. And then we painted the rest of the, of the letter I black to match. So it worked out perfect and that keeps the Mac Mini from moving forwards and backwards whenever something is plugged in. There's still lateral movement to the left and right with this method, but when the chassis slides in, it essentially blocks the Mac Mini from moving left and right too much. It can still move left and right a little bit, which would cause the power port to be a little bit off, but basically uh, if it does move a little bit left or right, you can stick a pencil or a pen or something inside that hole there where the USB-C extension is coming through and sort of leverage the pencil and just sort of move it. And you can... To help with the sliding, we also put duct tape on top of the Mac Mini. It just helps with a little bit with the grip. The Mac Mini is, you know, a slick aluminum, so we put duct tape uh, on top of, of the Mac Mini so that when it's upside down, it's just a little bit more of a grippy surface. So here's a picture of basically what it takes to modify your Mac Plus housing to mount a Mac Mini inside of it. It's not too difficult. We also had to extend the SCSI port two to three millimeters and we just used a drill bit for that and it just took a few seconds. And then there's the craft letter I from Michaels there on the front that was epoxied on. And when that's epoxied on, it's, it's uh, able, the Mac Mini fits in there like a glove really nicely and it, it secures the Mac Mini from moving forwards and backwards. Then for covering up the power switch and the power port, we just used a piece of felt also from Michaels and just cut that and super glued it on. And here's another picture kind of just showing know for, for better visual representation this is an older picture from before the painting but this you know this shows how the Mac Mini pushes the rear of that chassis up and and so those mounts have to be modified so that those holes there in the back of the chassis those circles can actually fit over one of those mounts with the Mac Mini under it and if we are able to leave some of those mounts like we have in this photo then it, it still secures this chassis in place and keeps it from moving which is pretty great. And here's a photo of just the extended SCSI port that we used a drill bit for. Probably could have done this a little bit cleaner, but I've never done you know anything like this before and you know probably could have looked a little bit nicer, but it just needed a tiny little modification in order for the power port to fit there in order to fit the power plug. Once we got it all together and got the proof of concept good, we decided to start the painting. And the painting was, this is the only picture I got from the actual painting project. It, I had no idea what I was doing with painting. I thought it would be a lot easier than it was. And basically ended up screwing up the paint job on this about four times, if you can believe that. And I had to sand it down and repaint it three or four times. I learned a lot about painting in this process. The differences between like acrylic and enamel paint and just how to properly coat the layers of paint and properly prime it and, and paint it again and how to properly set up your painting area so that things don't get blown onto it or you know mess it up and, and also how much paint we needed. I ended up using I think four or five cans of both the paint and primer. And that was the painting was actually the longest part of the pro project itself. Putting the Mac Mini together and, and mod, you know modding the mounts in the back wasn't too hard. It didn't take too much effort. It was the paint. And then I, I started running into weather issues. I live in a townhome complex, so I can't really paint inside. That would that would be really bad for me to try to paint inside. So I have to paint outside. But it became. 
uh, it got to a point of being winter time and most of the, the paint has a drying range of it has to be the primer had to be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit and the paint had to be above 55 degrees Fahrenheit for it to properly cool. So I ran into a problem with the winter where there were only so many days and only a couple hours of the day where it would actually be above 50 degrees or 55 degrees. So it made it, made it really difficult to even find the time to do the painting and have to sand it down and, and find another and wait for a day where it was going to be above 55 degrees uh, so it could actually dry. And I got a little antsy and actually ended up painting some of it in the cold in 45. In the 40s, what I ended up doing is putting it on like a removable pizza box, you know, like painting something on a pizza box, and then as soon as, as soon as the paint was laid, I would bring it back in the house so it could dry in this nice 70 degree house. But yeah, the painting was a large part of this project and took a lot longer than I thought. Although, you know, if I were to paint again, it, I could probably do it in one pass and it wouldn't be very difficult. I suppose if we take a step back, we also need to prep for the painting. And prepping for the painting was a small project in itself as well. We started off with retro brighting the Mac. The yellow wing on an old Mac does represent a certain type of mold that's gotten into the plastic and we don't want to encapsulate and have the paint sitting on top of that. So we did go ahead and retro bright this Mac. I prefer to use Salon hydrogen peroxide as opposed to the actual retro bright product. Hydrogen peroxide is 95% of the RetroBrite product, so it's basically the same thing and it's half the price. So the Salon Hydrogen Peroxide will be linked in the description below. Make sure to wear latex gloves when you are RetroBriting. And in my experience, it's best to RetroBrite by spraying the hydrogen peroxide on the pieces every 15 minutes in the sun and rotating them to make sure to get all of the sides and everything retrobrighted. And after six, seven, or maybe even eight or nine sprays uh, every 15 minutes in direct good sunlight, you'll be pretty retrobrighted. And your results may vary based on the, sun, the intensity of the sun that you have that day or how often you rotate. So there's a little bit of a procedure to the retrobrighting, but I think it's definitely a good process. After retro writing, then we use a steel wool pad to clean off the surface of the Mac really good. Steel wool is a fantastic product for removing the abrasions or the goo or the marks and the scuffs on the plastic that would actually be norm normally pretty tough even with soap and water. So a good light scrubbing with fine steel wool on the surface can prep it really good for painting. And then we would move on to the sink where we would do a nice soap and water and sponge to just clean out all the crevices and all the dust. And once it's dried, it will be ready for painting. And here is a picture of the back of the finished Mac Plus Mini um, with, with the ports that are accessible. You can see on the left, we have one fully accessible USB-A port. The HDMI port is mostly accessible. Then the USB-C port right next to that, which we're using for the extender. The USB-C port next to that one is not really accessible. It might be with a small enough plug. But then there's one more USB-C port there to the right. That one is accessible. The Ethernet is accessible and the power is accessible. So you pretty much got a full range of accessibility. So right there in the printer port, if you're able to stick your pinky in, it's pretty easy if your pinky is small enough to press the power button on the Mac Mini. And so that's how it turns on. I'm sure something could be fabricated, like a button that would have a little swing arm and the button could be 3D printed to maybe fit right over that hole for the, the printer port and it could maybe have a little swing arm on the back side so that when you push the button it would do the swing arm and just actually press the physical Mac Mini power button for you. That's probably something that can totally be done. And this is a picture just showing how we bring the USB-C extension from the back of the Mac Mini into the case. Overall, I'm really happy with how the project came out. I think it looks great, and I was even fortunate enough to find a wonderful condition black apple carrying tote bag from the period, which I think just really completes the set. You might have noticed in some of the photos and videos that there is System 6 running on this. That's actually from the VMAC emulator. That was a fun little project within itself. Since the M100 keyboard doesn't have an escape key on it, when using the VMAC emulator, there was no way to leave the emulator. 
However, BMAT can be customized and recompiled so that you can add an alt tab shortcut into the settings to be able to get out of VMAC. The settings were also customized in VMAC to fit the screen with the proper resolution and it was also set to a one times speed emulation so it feels just like a real Mac would have. The initial concept for the idea of this project was for it to be somewhat of a gift for Black Love. It could be a promotional item potentially in one of our Zoom backgrounds or our office lobby or conference room. People I'd like to thank for this project would be first off of course Retro Apple AT over on Etsy. Uh, he did a fantastic job uh, making the screen. Basically he has a 3D printer and he's able to 3D print a bezel specifically for the Mac 128K through the SE that can be fitted to a generic LCD screen. So he's kind of doing two things. He's making the 3D printed bezel, and then he's also sourcing an LCD screen that has that's small enough, that's the correct size, and has low enough power requirements that it can be powered by USB. And he's also providing a piece of acrylic uh, with the screen. So those three items together were immeasurable to this project and it wouldn't have made it possible. Currently at this moment, Retro Apple AT does not have any more screens for sale. He is selling 3D printed molds to put iPads in original Macs. However, he does say that he would be open to making more screens if there was a demand and if people asked. He's also open to selling his 3D print model file for the bezel for the screen. So if you had a 3D printer, you could potentially print your own 3D bezel using his model and source your own screen as well. I also wanted to thank Tinkerboy for making and providing the USB adapters for the Apple keyboard and mouse. It was wonderful to have those and to be able to use the original M100 mouse and keyboards with this project. I would also like to note that we went ahead and replaced the capacitors for the keyboard and mice with this project. We figured that since the keyboard and mice were 35 year old devices that were going to be hooked up to high levels of USB current, we figured it'd be good to go ahead and replace those capacitors. They were relatively inexpensive and easy to obtain from DigiKey. In sourcing the keyboard and mouse for this project, it was crucial that we needed to find the platinum color models of the devices as the platinum gray would look better with the contrast on the black. The platinum model keyboard and mice, however, were from later in the Mac Plus's production run. Most of the M100 model mice that came with the Mac 128K through the Pluses in the United States did not have capacitors. However, this later platinum model colored mouse was a Mitsumi Japanese model that was produced in Japan. And the Japanese platinum M100 mice contained capacitors. Well, all in all, I think it's time to bring this project to a close. I've had such a wonderful time working on it and navigating and exploring the difficulties over the past year and finding solutions. I'm so excited to get this into the hands of Black Club so it can start a new life and purpose and be appreciated by a new set of individuals. In closing, I thought it would be great to show a scene from my favorite video game, Mega Man Legends. It could also serve as a good sound test so you're able to hear what the speakers sound like. And if you like the scene, it's a video on my YouTube channel and you can watch the whole thing. So thank you so much for watching and happy Mac travels everyone. It appears I was in error assuming that a bureaucratic model such as myself would be able to best you in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, I was successful in keeping you occupied long enough for Eden to achieve optimal altitude before you could interfere. This is Mega Man Juno, bureaucratic model third class, authorization number 8677, requesting a reinitialization of this island systems and a memory backup of its bureaucratic systems.
If you wish to shoot me, please do not hesitate. My program has already been backed up in Eden's central core. I eagerly await my next act. Did they shun? Eden systems ready. Awaiting confirmation. Requested backup of bureaucratic model Mega Man Juno complete. Execution of catalog's reinitialization program will commence in 100 seconds. What should I do?